If you are in a friends with benefits situation and you want more, this is a great episode for you to listen to because there's a lot of confusion as to what friends with benefits relationship can go the distance and which can't. Well, of course, that is unique to each situation, but there are some parameters under which we can look and criteria of consumer or buyer that's also very important. If you know my book, you know that a consumer is under a certain criteria, five things that are inherent to every consumer. And when we want to look at probability so that we don't truly waste our time, we can look at that criteria. How does that balance out with the manifestation that we talk about as well? Well, that's the thing is that there is a divineness, so to speak, and an energy in the universe, and you can manifest anything that you want, but you must look at it also under a probability in terms of a time frame that is going to work for you. And in this case, Darlene needs to look at that because her man, Paul, is so high in the criteria of being a consumer that she can't really look at it for any anything right now. This is my belief. You may want to think about that as a limiting belief if you're more just a manifester, but I like to balance things out so that you have more of an understanding of what can be probable for your life in any short run. Paul and Darlene may be together eventually, but for Darlene to simply hold out for Paul, what will be the outcome for her in any short run? His children are young. The probability is low. It doesn't mean that there's no possibility. And Each person must look at it under that lens if they are in a friends with benefits situation. Is the pain and not getting the outcome hurting you to a degree that it really is hurting your manifestation as well? You want to think about it in that way. There's a lot we unpack here. I think you will get a lot if you are in a friends with benefits situation from listening to Darlene. And then you must make the determination for yourself. If you need my help with that, of course, come on the podcast. We can talk about that virtually for free and it's anonymous or you want to do a consult with me so I can give you more of my take and what you can do to, of course, increase your probability. Your possibility is always there. Let's increase your probability according to your man's criteria of being a consumer or a buyer for you. I'm so thankful for your advice. I love how intelligent and eloquent you are and still have love and given me some great guidance and direction. And now it's up to me to execute it. I feel a lot better just working through it. I thank you so, so much. I feel like you already are instilling more confidence in me that this is possible. Sick of sacrificing or settling in your romantic life? Welcome to Make Him Wonder with Coach Paula Grooms where women struggling in real relationships ask the expert. Unscripted, unfiltered, understandable coaching conversations to help passionate women succeed in love. Hi there, and welcome to Make Him Wonder. I'm your host, Coach Paula, a dating and relationship coach, licensed social worker, and author of the book, Why Won't He Commit? How a Man Decides to Make You the One. My guest today is 43-year-old Darlene, Darlene separated a year and a half ago and has since moved back to her hometown where she got reacquainted with an old friend, 40-year-old Paul. Paul has been divorced for nearly three years and the two began a friends with benefits relationship. Although Paul says he loves Darlene and doesn't want to let her go, he also doesn't want commitment. Darlene knows she deserves more than just a sexual relationship, however. She's done a lot of healing and growth work and feels this situation has put her 20 steps back. She wants to know how to permanently change her subconscious programming and hopes I will be able to help her secure what she desires and knows she deserves. Welcome, Darlene. Hi, Paula. I'm glad you're doing this today because I can imagine that this is weighing on you heavily when you say it's put you 20 steps back. Yes, indeed, it it has. That's definitely how I feel at the moment. So tell me about how it's evolved with Paul 
to get to the point that you are just having a friends with benefits relationship? Did it start like that or did it start out differently? Um, we have been friends since we were, I was about 19, 20 years old, actually, about 20 years old. We met amongst friends and I went away to college. You know, we both kind of had our lives. And then after college, I moved back to New York for a period and we became close friends. And at the time, we may have just kind of hooked up, but we were very good friends and it was nothing serious. And around that time, he... This was about, you know, I was like around 28 years old then. And uh, he had someone that he was seeing and he actually had gotten her pregnant. And he actually came to me and told me, I, you know, I got this girl pregnant. I feel like I need to do right by her, but she upsets me like this, this, and this. We had a long conversation. And for whatever reason back then, I told him he shouldn't marry her. I didn't realize the feelings I had for him then. But I did tell him because of all of the complaints he had about her, I recommended that he not go forward with marrying her just because because she was pregnant. But obviously he did. He went forward with that. It was fine. He went, you know, he went his way. I went mine. Actually, a couple of years later, I did a bunch of like healing work. I moved out of New York. I met someone, got married, had a pretty wonderful marriage for many years. And about 2021, I was having marital troubles and I was leaving my marriage and I was planning on leaving my marriage. And a couple of years later, in 2018, Paul and I connected again via texting and phone when I was in the process of coming back to New York. We were very excited about seeing each other. We were friends and then we started hooking up. And that was in summer of 2022, I want to say. And then it was kind of like we we would see each other, we would hook up. We only went out like really on a date like once because I would go to his house and hang out. We would text back and forth and we lived really close at the time. He he was living at actually his parents' house because since his divorce to save money and get his stuff together. And over the last year and a half, basically, that's pretty much been the norm. We, We hang out, we see each other, we hook up, but nothing serious has come of it. It's also been a time where I've been letting go of my old relationship and starting a new job. I came back to my career here in New York, and he's been involved in getting his life together. I have a daughter, and he also has two children, and he got out of a very difficult marriage. Like My divorce is amicable and peaceful. Or separation. It, I we have I haven't fully done the paperwork yet, so we're actually separated for the last year and a half. But it's amicable. My ex lives out of state. His was more a more contentious situation where it's just a very difficult situation for him. Once a week, he travels out out of state to see his child, and it's driving distance. He doesn't stay there or anything. His children, and then so it's very hard on him. His situation because of like the logistics of how much traveling he's doing and how much he's feels like he's giving into his former relate you know relationship and all of the pressures like with his kids he obviously has a lot of responsibility which I do as well is it the same woman that he got pregnant years ago that became his wife yes he eventually married her a couple of years later and how long were they married I think they were together about 11 years okay and it's been nearly three years that he's been divorced and he lives in your hometown now with his parents? Yes. Well, he doesn't live well somewhat with his parents. He lives in, in a home that is of his parents, but his parents don't live there. So he's alone? Yes. And the kids come and visit him there, or, or he's always traveling to them? He travels to them, he picks them up, and he brings them back. I see. How far is that for him? It's about three hours. Each way? Yes. What's the custody arrangement? Now I think it's every other weekend and once a week, during the week, middle of the week. So he's being a diligent, you know, good dad. Yes. Dutiful, I should say. Yes. But that's got to wreak havoc on his life. Uh, Yes, it does. Why is it that he moved back to your hometown rather than stay near the children? I think it was a situation where the ex moved to New Jersey and she decided to live there. And uh, that's just we're not where he was from. And but yeah, financially, it wasn't feasible for him at the time to live there. And his job was in the hometown. So where is he working now? Here in, in New York, in, in his hometown. I see. Okay. So how long have you had this, your term, hooking up kind of arrangement? 
And since I moved back to New York in 2020, the summer of 2022. Okay. So it's been about a year. Yes, about a year and a half. Okay. So what do you most want to know from me? I feel like I put myself in the situation of friends with benefits. And I would like to get myself out of it. I really love him and I respect the man he is. I respect that he's a diligent father and everything that he's doing in order to make sure that, you know, his children are okay. But I also feel like I want more out of a relationship with someone. I want more out of a relationship with him. And I just don't know if I have put myself in a place of friends with benefits that is permanent. And he just feels like, I'm never going to go anywhere. And I'm. Always, he said it to me. He's like, we're always going to be friends no matter what, because I have tried to end it with him. I, I've said, like, I don't know if I can do this. And he says, well, whatever you decide is fine. We're always going to be friends no matter what. And I know that my friendship is valuable to him. And I do know that he cares about me. I just, I know that he does. And I understand the pressures that he has going on in his life. But I also don't want to be stuck in this situation where I'm loving and caring about someone and waiting for something that may never materialize. So over the course of this year and a half, have you truly ever ended it? Have you dated others? What has that been like? I ended it once. I did. I went no, I, I went no contact once earlier this year. Uh, around May and I did start dating. I actually went on a dating website and I met about three people on the website. One which I started dating for about two months and it didn't really work out, just weren't in sync. And I blocked him at that point. And then I think in like July, I got back in touch with him, just kind of said hello. And then it just started again. I see. Thank you. So when you say you went no contact, how did that actually, detail by detail, come down? I just stopped. I blocked him. Like, I blocked him on my social media. I blocked him on my phone. And I just stopped calling him. And he stopped he, I don't know if he was texting me. He might have been. Okay. So still something is missing. So out of the blue, you said nothing. You did nothing. You just took him off your social media and blocked him? Or had you talked I don't remember at the moment if it was a full-on conversation because I, I, there have been moments where I emotionally I feel like I've said too much or I, I don't really remember how it happened at the moment. And honestly, I think I deleted the text messages to even look back. But we, it wasn't like a face-to-face -face conversation where I said, okay, I'm done or, or anything like that. It was just I think I just stopped calling him or texting. Okay. And then in July, which was about two and a half months later, something like that, you just reached out and said what? And I just said, hey, how are you? And we just kind of like started talking and our usual just chitter tatter and just kind of like flirting. Uh-huh. And how did it go down that you started up sexually again? Yeah, we were probably just talking. Like we usually, we flirt, maybe we were like flirting via text and then... I, I probably said I'm coming over or he said come over one of the two, which is usually how it happens because we tend to see each other about once a month and we're like we talk, we hang out a little bit and then we hook up. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you want to know if it's possible to totally turn this relationship around. Yes. The truth is, if any woman has ever done it, it's possible. That does not mean it's necessarily probable and I'm not hearing great stuff here. However, because you want it in the way that you do, it's only going to serve you to give it the full college try, meaning do what works with men and manifest it. Because anything else, you will feel totally disappointed in yourself for not trying, for giving up, I assume. Yes, I agree with you. Yes. Yeah. So how did you come across me and what led to you coming on today? I, I found you on Instagram a while back and I'd been watching your videos and I joined the 8020 program and I'd been listening to your podcast and I don't know, I've, I've reached a point where I know that I can't sit in this hookup situation anymore. Things came to a head about a couple of weeks ago, about two weeks ago, where we spent some time together. I went to where, where he is, and we had a beautiful time together. And the next day, he texted me, and things were fine. 
And then the next day, two days later, for whatever reason, I went online and I saw something that had been posted. And to me, it, it appeared as if he, this, this friend of his online was at a place where he, where he works. And the person put like this sob video. And I conjured up this whole huge story in my mind about how he had been hooking up with this girl. And I got it in me that I had to talk that this was all the proof I needed that he'd been hooking up with someone else because he told me that he hadn't been hooking up with anyone else. And I got it in my head that he was hooking up with this girl. And I got so pissed off that I told him, I need to see you. I need to talk to you. And I went to his house. And I talked to him, I saw this thing, and I don't know what's going to happen after this conversation, because I doubted myself driving over there. I'm like, what, I kind of thought, like, what am I doing? But I just kind of wanted things to, like, come to a head in a way. And this is really hard for me to talk about, because it, it, for me, it, it was really embarrassing that I went over there in that way, and, and came off to him that way. So I told him, I, I, I explained to him, I don't really know how this is going to go, because I don't know if after this conversation we're ever going to speak to each other again. I don't know if things are going to change because like the way this last year has been has just not felt good to me. We hook up once a month and that's all that there that this is. But like I saw this thing and it really upset me. And he's like, what did you see? And I explained to him like what I had seen. And he's like, oh, this person, this person was at my job because they work with me. They work with the people at my business. He's like, why wouldn't you just ask me? Why would you, you know, why, why would you drive all the way over here just to tell me this? You could have just asked me. And he seems pretty upset. He's like, Cause I, have I ever shown you to be that I'm that type of person? And he got really insulted that I would ever doubt him in any way. And I felt bad, you know, I felt kind of, I felt really stupid because I'm in my realized like I should have just asked. And now I've like put myself out there completely like a fool, like a jealous, crazy person that's been stalking his social media. And I got a little upset. We didn't argue or or anything. And I told him, I, I just don't know. I don't know what's going on with you. I don't know what's going on with your life. Because I felt like in the last couple of months, he, we haven't really like been talking and him telling me like, well, like, what's really going on with him. So I ended up leaving. He's like, well, I have to work. It's really late. I have to work very early. And I said, okay, fine. And I left. And the next morning I texted him. I was like, I feel really foolish and I'm sorry. And he texted me back. Don't feel bad. It's okay. You felt how you felt. And he tried to appease how I was feeling. And then probably a couple of days later, I texted him this long message, basically using him as a freaking journal of like, it's my own stuff, it's my own insecurities, and I'm sorry if I insulted him. I just wanted this whole spiel that was unnecessary, further embarrassing, feeling like I embarrassed myself. And he never responded to that long message. And then on Christmas, actually, on Christmas, he sent me a, a Merry Christmas to you, to you and your daughter who you said her name, uh, wishing you all the pleasantries that, that life and the best life has to offer. Just sent me that. And then I didn't respond to, I didn't want to respond. And then the next day I did. And I said, hey, I was busy. Thank you so much. Merry Christmas to you and your family. And I left it at that. But it was that happening. It just made me, like, I just don't feel like I'm showing up like myself at all. Like this is being jealous in that way and showing up in that way just really embarrassed me. And I just know that I need help. Like I can't keep acting like this. Like I'm acting like I'm not a prize to be won when I deserve so much more. Mm -hmm. And you hit on something, Darlene, which is really great. And that is in your intro, you know that this is about your subconscious programming, that part of you that doesn't feel like you. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. And that's a really good thing, the fact that you know that, because then you can do something about it. Because that is at play here. There's something about him in particular that harkens back to your earliest experience of love. And likely mostly the relationship, meaning the fact that you don't know if he's all in, you have to question all the time whether you're wanted, whether you're chosen, you don't feel respected, all of it. And if you start with that, and then you do what we know works with men, you have a chance, just like I said, there is always a possibility. 
and you deserve to do it wholeheartedly because it's almost impossible for us to just decide, well, it's not probable, so I'm going to give up and end it. I agree. There's a lot of old programming that this has, this has really shaken up. I'm, I'm adopted, so I, I'll just put that out there, obviously. And I, these were things that I thought I dealt with. You know, I thought, oh, I had this great relationship for so many years with the person that cared and loved and loved me probably still does and um your ex-husband yes yes Mm -hmm. and I had this you know relationship and it went it went for the most part it went well and I thought I had healed all of these things obviously not this has definitely brought up some old wounds my old abandonment wounds and and it's and it's interesting because I'm back in touch with my biological mother and she she suffers from depression and she also doesn't call and avoids and avoids just contact in general. Mm. There's a lot of there's a lot of similarities, and this is not. And she came back to my life as an adult, and you know she still does that. She's you know she went through a lot in her life. I don't judge her for it. It's just and it, there's a lot of similarities that, that I've seen myself between the way that Paul acts and the way that my mother is still the, to this day. And I've done a lot of like healing work with with healing the relationship with my mother and coming into compassion for her. And I think that a lot of the same compassion that I've had towards my mother, like I've, I've had towards him as well, there's just a lot of similarities there. And this is definitely bringing up some really old, old wounds. I understand, yes. Were you adopted at an older age or as an infant? I, I was taken away by social services at, probably at a couple of months old. And I was probably with one person in Manhattan for about a year. And then I was adopted by, I was taken by a family with foster care until, but with the same family until I was five and they adopted me. So at a couple of months, you went to live with one person or family for about a year? Mm-hmm, yes. And then you went to a foster family until you were five? Yes. Wow. My foster family adopted me there, and, and my brother. It was two of us. Wow. Wow. Well, I hope you know how resilient and amazing you are to have had that as your experience and handling what you're handling now, because this is deep for you in a way that, how do I explain it? Um, the wounding you had at the ages you did. Now, the two months, mm, yes, there is an issue with that, and it's detrimental. But you then were with either one caregiver or several for a year, which is the most important year of your life in terms of attachment and feeling safe, loved. In terms of your subconscious, it's enormous. And then you were taken away, yes, by a family that ended up adopting you, wonderful, but that tear in your subconscious programming has to be mended. Do you know what I mean by that? Yes, I do. So this makes a lot of sense, what you're going through, so much sense. And I hope that makes you feel better because there's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing odd about this. It makes so much sense because our programming from birth to age seven gives us our foundational experience of love. And that we grow up and transfer onto a romantic love interest. So this is the perfect storm. You know, this is the perfect storm for me to heal this. Yes, you can look at it like that, which is great. But it's the perfect storm because you are attempting to get love, validation, being affirmed by someone, that you are chosen, that you are worthy, that you are lovable, that you are safe with a love interest. You're attempting to get that from someone who can't give it to you at this time anyway. And so, of course, it just will tweak you beyond anything else. And it can be quite crazy making. It feels out of control. It does. But you have the agency to work on your programming and do what has a chance of working with him. The former is the most important part of it. Doing what works with men is actually 
a smaller part of it because foundationally you must be really solid in the knowing that you're worthy, honored, lovable, safe, and chosen in order to get that from the someone else. Here's something for you to think about and kind of understand. Your husband, you said the love is there and likely still is, and you know it. In other words, you knew you were chosen. It was safe. You were validated, honored, loved. Is that true? I, I was. Towards the end, it didn't feel like I was. There were, we were having issues, lots of issues, and that's why like, we weren't getting along. And towards the end, I really felt like I wasn't, and that's why I left. So tell me, did that ever feel as compelling to you as this relationship with Paul? In the beginning, it was really beautiful, and I, and I loved him, but no. And that is part and parcel of the subconscious programming of love, your experience of love not being there. What I mean by that is that everybody has like a thumbprint of their experience of love. That's what happens to us psychologically from birth to age seven when we are in theta brainwave, and which is a hypnotizable state. And whatever we receive then, good, bad, indifferent, doesn't matter, great amount of love, no love, caring, not caring, attention, not attention, whatever, is our experience of love and our definition. So I knew you would say it never felt like Paul because it doesn't fit your experience and definition of love. So your definition of love goes something like this. I need to be something in order to get love, to be right enough, to be chosen. Something is not inherently right with me because I was given up and moved around. I mean, Thankfully, your parents who adopted you provided you with a lot of that, but there was still psychic damage done prior to that that, you know, caused a bit of a cut, so to speak. But does it make sense to you? Yes. They were also el they were an elderly couple and they were also very distant. So I see. Also just they also had their own trauma, so Sure, sure. But that's why when we get freely given love, interest, overt attention, caring, and love from a man, and our programming is what we just talked about with you, it doesn't feel as compelling. It doesn't feel like home. It doesn't feel mm, intense. It's nice. It's lovely, but it doesn't feed us because our subconscious is not being given our experience of what love is. Again, even when we are abjectly abused as children from birth to age seven, that will be part of our love programming, that that's what love is. So this is why Paul feels very, very compelling to you. And it's almost like if you can fix this and make this work, then you're validated, so to speak. Everything would be right with the world. It's interesting that you say that. Earlier this year, I had this uh, this experience. Let's just call it a, a dream that I had. And um, in that experience, I saw myself as a baby. And actually, the first three months of my life, I was actually, I wasn't born early, but I was sick as a baby. So I was actually in an incubator for those first three months. I saw myself as a baby in that incubator and I saw my body like releasing all of the hormones that a baby releases when it's born of love and of, and of joy but just feeling so sad and lonely. And, and I saw that that was the moment where I programmed that as love. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Wow, that's like a divine experience almost. So you will need to be working on that to rectify the experience for yourself. In other words, Paul can't do this. He has really no part. He plays no part in it. He can't do it. He's just the person that it's transferred to. And that's a good thing because then we can look at it. Oh, okay. Well, then you have the control. Great. And I'm going to give you my opinion as to what you can expect if 
you commit to doing this work? Because I'm sure it's, well, I know that it's first and foremost in your mind about how do we just fix this? Because I know he has caring and love for me. I know he loves being with me. I know he wants this to some degree, correct? Yes. And you can attempt to do that. And at least through the attempt, you will know whether or not it's possible in the short run. And it doesn't mean it's not possible in the long run. And I'm going to tell you about that in just a moment. I trust you're enjoying Make Him Wonder and that you're getting a lot of helpful information for the life of love you desire and deserve. So if you're not part of the 80-20 Wonder Club yet, you need to be because now Make Him Wonder is exclusive, a members-only club to listen to every episode, past, present, and future, in full, all ad-free. The 80-20 Wonder Club is a Make Him Wonder membership that gives you all of seasons one, two, and three in a categorized list by age and relationship status, and a multimedia library of my content, including my book, relationship evals, and my Mechanics of Men Mindset Manual, a weekly action step you can focus on to attract and keep the man of your dreams and have him committing to you completely in the coming months. Make this the moment you start living as an 80-20 Wonder Woman, because love, like life, is best lived in 80-20. When you do 80% of what works with men, the 20% you don't won't much matter. Join the 80-20 Wonder Club by going to the 8020wonder.club. Don't miss out. Go now to the 8020wonder.club. You and your man will be glad you did. So we're back with 43-year-old Darlene dealing with a difficult situation emotionally with her longtime friend Paul that it's become a friends with benefits relationship. I'm sure, Darlene, he's very happy with it. And it's interesting that you brought up that you thought maybe he was with someone else. This isn't about anyone else for him at all. I hope that makes you feel good. In other words, it's not that he's looking for someone else. And when that someone else comes along, you're gone, that he wants someone else instead that any of that. Does that ring true to you? Yes. He loves the situation as it is. It's very good for him. He has a friend that he can share with and a great sex partner. In order to turn this around, and I'm going to be very honest with you, I do not believe that will be in any short run. Because you see, you tried it to some degree back, mm, I don't know how long ago, that's about seven months or so ago, eight months, whereby you just cut him off. And he did not make any real attempts to get it back or to change what he was doing. In other words, he didn't come find you. He knew where you lived. He could find you if he wanted to. Just because he couldn't get through on the phone doesn't mean that he couldn't get to you. But he didn't. He let you go because that's what good men do. It's the puppy principle at work, if you know my book. Because the number one tenet of a good man is that you do right by women and children, regardless of your feelings. Number one tenet of good men. And it's like us, if we fall in love with a puppy and say we took it home and we realize, oh my gosh, I thought this was going to be a little lap dog and it's a dog that should be one of those dogs doing the uh, the fancy running trainings and it needs that kind of exercise and attention every day. Because you love it, you don't hold on to it. You do what is right for that creature. That's love and doing the right thing. This should be on a farm with the kids hurting other animals, whatever. That's right by that little lovely thing. And it would be selfish of me to continue on just because I love it. I've got to suck it up. It's going to hurt me, but I'm going to do what is right for that which I love. And that's what men do because they love us all as women as the pretty puppies we are. They love us all. Big, small, short, tall. So he let you go because it was right. He didn't come find you. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. He's a good guy. Then we go to the puppy principle for another reason that he's in no place to adopt. So like us, no matter how much we love a puppy, if we are not in the right place financially in terms of our home and the environment and the way we can 
be responsible for it and to it, we don't do it because we're doing right by the little thing. And that's what men do. It has to be right time, right puppy. And right puppy does not trump right time. It can, but it takes commitment. I mean, unbridled commitment until. Now let's go to what you do with him and the subconscious programming. The subconscious programming you likely have heard me talk about a lot, who I recommend, the modalities that you want to be using to fill up your subconscious mind with the right messages. And it's not reprogramming, it's overriding the old programming. In other words, programming is programming. It's always there. We must continually work to override it. I use the analogy of fire breathers. There's not a human alive that isn't wary or afraid of fire. We know you touch it, it burns you. It's very painful. So we treat it with a lot of respect and care, but yes, we're afraid of it. That's programmed in us as children. Very good program. And our subconscious is beautiful in that everything we learn, it's programmed and we don't have to learn it again. Tying your shoes is a program. You don't have to think about it. Later on, we can program our minds like driving is a program we learned later in life. But make no mistake, it's a program and you can do it without much thinking about it. So the analogy of a fire breather, the guys that take a flaming torch and put it down their throat and put the flaming torch out in their throat. They are the perfect example of overriding a program. The program of fearing fire never leaves and they have great respect for it, but they have systematically trained themselves to override it. And that is what we must do with our subconscious programming of what love is. And it is a combination of self-concept work of, or work on our mental diet, meaning what we are telling ourselves, actually talking to our subconscious from our conscious mind, like we would talk to a, a different person, a, an entity, a child. In other words, when you are thinking about him, and probably you are thinking about him a lot, correct? Yes. It's sometimes tantamount to feeling like it's an obsession, correct? Yes. So that is when we have to step in with our conscious mind and say, okay, subconscious, we're going to stop this. We are not going to go into the new year with this kind of nonsense. We are lovable. We are worthy. We are honored. We are valued. We're going to stop the chatter. And there's a great book called Chatter. It's on Amazon because his name escapes me that talks about this and actually doing it. This is a very utilitarian way to go about it. Then we do what's very important, which is sleep meditations, because we're in theta brainwave as adults for a very short time each day. And that is right before we fall asleep. And when we wake up for a very short time, very little window and a little bit in sleep. So you want to use I am sleep meditations to help change your subconscious and self-concept. You likely have heard me talk about all the people on YouTube you can listen to and watch to help you do this. There's so much out there now to help you work on it and to never be alone in this endeavor because it has to be your raison d'etre for minimum of two weeks time while you're doing the stuff, the things you're going to need to do with him to reset this relationship to possibly restart it at another time. Because make no mistake, you can continue with him forever like this. In other words, there is no indication that he is going to be looking for another relationship at all because of what I just told you about where he is in his life right now. Men don't do that. Like if we can't have the environment we need, if we can't deal with the puppy and be very responsible to it as well as for it, we're not adopting. 
no matter how much we want a puppy, we know that we will one day, correct? Yes, I agree. So you have a big decision to make, and that is whether or not you will embark on this endeavor or whether you can change your programming and continue to see him for the benefits you get. And that is the sexual benefits and the friendship. I can't tell you whether for yourself, whether that's going to be the healthiest thing or not. It's incredibly difficult. Doesn't mean it's impossible, just incredibly difficult. Then we look at how he perceives it. And I'm hearing stuff like, I call him, I would text him. There's just stuff that you would need to change about how you relate to him that will be helpful for you, regardless of whether or not you go full force with this. The first thing that I would like to go full force with is my own programming. That's the first thing I want to get a handle on and work on transforming and, and overriding, as you say. That's the first and most important thing, because I know that that's going to be with me regardless of whoever is in my life. I, I agree with you that this is something that has taken up way too much space in my head, and it's not a healthy thing. And if it's not him, I think I'll recreate the situation with someone else. I see that. Mm -hmm. And I know the, so the first thing I want to get at working at is on me. And if later on down the line, something happens with him, fantastic. But I know that I can't continue in this way any longer. It's not healthy for me. It's not something that I want for myself. I don't want to have anyone as friends with benefits. I know I'm better than that. Even though it's, I'm grateful to, to the last year and a half, I, because I know that I deserve better than a friends with benefits situation. I definitely want to work on myself. This definitely could go on forever in this way, and I don't want it to go on forever in this way. I know that I deserve better, I can get better, and I, I'm not going to sit in, in, a, in a pile of my own shit of my own creation. Like I, That was one of my main questions, how do I work with this programming? Because as I said, it, it can. I don't want it to show up in another relationship again because it will just recreate itself and rear its ugly head at another point in my life, even if I did by some miracle change this now with him. So this is one of the main reasons why I approached you because when I hear you in your conversations with people, I see that you understand it from a psychological and a spiritual perspective and, and, I, and I really respect you for that. And I know, knowing that I wanted to make this change for the new year, for myself, for my future, I, I heard you and I literally felt like it was like sent from above. So thank you, I appreciate this. This is not to say that I don't want something with him in the future because I do, but I don't want it in this way from this. I don't want to be in this position of feeling like this or this position of weakness. No, I want if it's him or whoever else. I want to come from a place of strength and of power and of love. And I'm not fully there. And I want to be. That's great to hear. And thank you. That's why I do what I do. And it's very fulfilling to help women get to this point because we're so deserving. We are loving the world. And we give men such a gift with our love. And you can do this in a way that will help you get through the tough part. And that is through manifestation, if you at all believe in it. Do you? I do. Absolutely. Okay. So those of you who know my work, you know that I adhere to the Neville Goddard Law of Assumption Manifestation technique, so to speak. And you'll hear me many times say you live in the knowing that you're going to have what it is that you desire. And that's done with various mindfulness techniques, imagining techniques. And along with that, you do what we just talked about with the continual work on your programming, meaning the affirmations you tell yourself, because the subconscious is like a recorder. And while we can't reprogram the old recording, it's kind of like we can record over what was put in. And kind of like the old style, you know, cassette tapes, is that if you record it over something, if there was any mm, glitch or anything, you'd hear part of the old recording. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to be very mindful and continually fill ourselves. And it's a practice. It becomes a way of living 
and of life. Just like if you were to take up something like yoga. You don't just do it for two weeks and then, oh yeah, I do yoga. No, you do it every day or every other day or you practice it. And the more you do it, you get good at it. Then if you only do it a couple times a week, it comes back to you and is just what you need. So that's that. The sleep meditations. And then with him, it's going to be how you set it up so that it's high value, so that it's not angry, it's not disappointed in him. It's simply high value and you make him wonder because the just cutting it off and the ghosting, so to speak, that sends the wrong message because you want to take 100% responsibility for having been in it. In other words, he didn't twist your arm. He never meant to do anything to hurt you. He knows you're a fully formed adult and make your own decisions. So we don't want to make him the bad guy, right? No. Mm -hmm. So you have to get ready for that and you have to really be ready to do it so that you absolutely know it is what you want. You absolutely know that with manifestation that it's going to work. You don't know how. And with manifestation, we never deal with the how. We just stay with what we want. And what's called like the bridge of incidents will happen underneath and come about to make our manifestation possible. The bigger the hurdle, there is a component of the longer takes. And we think of it as seeds. So a thought is like a seed. A manifestation, a desire is everything's energy in the world and it's a seed. It's a mental seed. Well, just like with regular seeds in Mother Nature, there's a big difference between taking an acorn and planting it and getting an oak tree or taking a tulip bulb and planting it and getting a tulip. In this analogy, we want to think of this as an oak tree because there's nothing indicating in the 3D world because you've already tried it. There is nothing indicating, especially with his life the way it is right now, that this is a tulip bulb. In other words, you're going to plant the seed and it's going to come up in a couple of weeks. No, that's just my, and many would say, uh, Paula, that's just wrong. That's a limiting belief. Don't put a limiting belief on it. I'm just giving it to you straight and how I see it. In other words, if I were just a manifesting coach, I would not be telling you that. But because I work with this dating and relationships with men and what is most probable and what's going on with him as a man, that's why I give you both sides to it. Am I making myself clear? You're very clear. Okay. Yes, extremely clear. It's completely clear. And I, I agree. And I think every everything that's ha that's happened and the situation and just energetically planetarily for me this year i think everything supports what you're saying great and you can do that and you can set yourself on a really good path here and that will ultimately bode well for you whatever happens with him because i think what you know now is if you continue down this road nothing truly good will come of it i agree Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can do that. And I do this podcast to introduce people to it. And for those that can work with me, we work together on it. I understand that some people can, some people can't, but there's a lot that is out there for you to do on your own, read on your own, research on your own, listen on your own, all of it. And then it's simply going to be how you, in a very high value way, Wondering what I'm going to tell Darlene she needs to do in a high-value way to have any possibility with Paul? In the rest of this episode, I outline what Darlene must say and do with Paul to position herself as a woman for a real relationship rather than just a friends with benefits. And because I want you to get the results you desire with your current or future Mr. Right, I invite you to check out the 8020 Wonder Club, where you can hear the rest of this episode with Darlene and so much more. The 8020 Wonder Club is an exclusive membership-only club of the Make Him Wonder podcast, where you'll get over 150 ad-free episodes categorized by age and relationship status, plus all new episodes the moment they're formatted and ready to be aired. Unfiltered coaching conversations like this one, with all my advice and principles to have you succeeding in your romantic life. 
but there is much more. The 8020 Wonder Club includes my Making Magic with Men Mindset Manual, a weekly video series of mindset and mechanics practices for you to do at your own pace each and every week. It alone is valued at over $500 and is all yours as a member. Join monthly and cancel at any time or save by committing to a six or 12 month membership. And not only will you save by committing to more, you'll receive a full coaching intensive experience where you'll be talking to me in a conversation like you just heard. You choose the date anytime during your 12 months and I'll be answering all your questions on getting what you desire and deserve in your romantic life. Check it out at the 8020wonder.club and join us as that is the only way you'll be able to hear what I tell Darlene is best to say and do with Paul. Don't miss out on how to make your man wonder in the right way to have divine right results in your relationship or how to start dating in a way that guides a potential Mr. Right to do right by you. Go now to the8020wonder.club. That's the8020wonder.club. You and your love will be glad you did.